Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SA Accounting Academy. Uh, here's a short clip on one of our previous webinars. I hope that you really do enjoy it. It's amazing how you think that you've got all the time in the world and the next minute all the time in the world is gone. Um, so <laughs> I apologize for being a minute or two late. Um, we are all good to go. Um, I was actually so early, I was ready for the session at nine o'clock, um, sitting waiting here very uh, eagerly. And then uh, Maya reminded me at AA that um, we were starting at 10. Uh, and then I still managed to be two minutes late. So I am so sorry about that. But good morning. Welcome. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a beautiful sunny day in the Midlands here, but it is freezing. So I hope you are warmer than where I am sitting right now. Although it's, it's in the, one, again, one of those days where the sun looks like it should be working, but I think it's broken. Um, it's Friday. Can you believe it that we are, like the first week of August is finished. And um, this year really is flying. And um, yeah, let's let's have a bit of fun and end on an interesting note for the week. Um, so thank you so much for joining me and thank you for um, accommodating the movement of the date. I know we were supposed to do the session yesterday. Um, unfortunately, I'm uh, I'm consulting with a legal counsel on a, a court matter as an expert witness. And unfortunately, when counsel calls you to chambers, um, it's not always as flexible as you'd like it to be. So, so I do appreciate everybody's um, leniency. I do try and uh, get it so that it doesn't impact on my webinar training sessions, um, but sometimes it just can't be helped. So, so thank you for those of you that um, were, were generous enough to adapt. Okay. Today's session, we've actually got quite a bit to talk about in an hour. Um, and it's a session that I, I actually do have fairly strong feelings about because I spend a lot of time mediating. I know in the code of conduct, you've got to be very careful about advocating. And this is something that I reflect quite often on when I get called into these spaces and I get called into these discussions. Um, I, I need to, uh, it's, to me, it's quite an ethical um, challenge. And I sit back when I'm approached and when I'm, I'm asked to liaise and discuss this, um, whether or not I'm potentially going to be seen as, a, as advocating for one side of the table or another side of the table. And our code of conduct as professional accountants um, always reminds us to be cognizant and aware that advocating for uh, is, a, is a threat and that we need to have safeguards in place. And by advocating, sort of being seen to be on one side of the table's favor more than the other. But often it's one party that's approached you to assist them um, with a conflict or with a disagreement. And uh, you are there to give um, guidance and advice. But you've got to remember that when you get called into these situations, we are not attorneys, we are accountants. And we have to be unbiased. We have to be objective. Um, so advocacy is a threat to our objectivity. Um, and we've got to have integrity and due care and, and all that stuff, but and confidentiality and you know all of that goes to reason. But just and familiarity is another threat. Um, possibly it's a friend or, or a client that you've had for a long time that has got a disgruntled minority shareholder, or they are the disgruntled minority shareholder, um, and then they're wanting to get some guidance and some assistance. Or you're dealing with a company that's got a stubborn and challenging shareholder, um, and then what do you do? So shareholding, although the act and the situation, you know, it looks quite straightforward, in reality and in practice, this is most probably one of the areas where there is quite a bit of conflict. Um, as we always say with these things, when everything is going well, life is easy. Okay. Um, when everything is going well, life is easy, but it's when things aren't going well that we need to pay attention to, to it. And I one of the best things you can do as a um, accountant and as a consultant and as a practitioner, um, and if you're working in business, um, being the financial role is to anticipate problems, anticipate potential pitfalls and areas of concern and patch them before they are problematic. Okay, because I do believe in dealing with people that it is much easier to sit around the table and discuss um, how you're going to resolve a matter when everybody is happy and when everybody is relaxed and cheerful and in a good mood um, to discuss, it's kind of like writing your ANC um, or your last will and testament. It's much easier to write those, those rather controversial documents when the sun is shining and everybody is happy and in a good mood than when the storm clouds are, bu uh, are building on the horizon. Okay, so it's, it's quite strategic. And this sort of feeds back into the MRI document. As I said, when we were doing the MRI, a lot of the discussion that we're going to do this week and next week with the director session as well um, are part of the thinking that you need 
to bring back to drafting of that document. Okay, so um, today's session is two, for, it's a two for the price of one, okay, because shareholders and shares go together. You are a shareholder because you hold shares. Your shares give you the rights, okay, and, and dictate often um, the way that you engage with the company because your votes and um, your responsibilities and all the rest come from the description of the shares um, for, for many respects. So uh, if you're wanting to get more or be more personalized in your engagement with the company, it's going to come through from the rights attached to the shares, okay? So of course, there are general rights and there's, there's overarching rights as being just a shareholder to a company, but the share is the, the instrument that um, any deviation from the norm will attach to. Okay. Remember what I said last week in the MRR discussions is that shareholders agreements have been defanged and declawed. Okay. Um, if you are still in the mindset that shareholders agreements are beginning of everything and all, um, I need to, to remind you that it's not quite that anymore. Okay, shareholders agreements, um, although there's definitely a place for them, they're not what they were in the past. So if you've got terms and conditions that are universal to all shareholders, if you've got terms and conditions that are sacred um, to the company. And remember the MRI is the shareholder's document. Um, it belongs to the shareholders. It is their people's document. Um, it really should be in the MRI and not in a shareholder's agreement because the MRI has statutory status, okay? Um, the courts will look to the MRI above the Companies Act if you have alterable provisions um, or you've got provisions which you can make stricter than the Companies Act. The MRI will stand ahead of the Companies Act. Um, it obviously can't contravene the Companies Act when you've got unalterable provisions, but it is a very, very powerful governing constitutional document um, and it manages the relationship between shareholders. Uh, obviously, once you've basically exhausted the provisions of the MRI and the Companies Act, only then does the shareholders' agreements kick in. Okay. I do see and I, I do consult with clients um, and I will say to them, okay, well, this particular scenario I want in a shareholders' agreement because this particular scenario is unique to these two shareholders. It is not something that I'm going to follow through on future transactions or into other relationships. It is a particular situation between the way this shareholder is acquiring their shares or between the way we're doing this. It's not something we will necessarily offer to every other shareholder in the same space or in the same manner. And I don't want it in the MRI to create precedence or, or uh, um, expectation by others. Okay, and maybe things like a dividend policy might be there if I don't want to offer the same dividend policy. Um, I, d I don't want to have a set dividend policy, for example. So, um, although be careful because precedents can be set as well. Okay, so how do you become a shareholder? The capitalization of, sh of, of the company, that's your share section. Talking about these shares, um, a share is a proprietary unit of the company. Okay, so it is a unit of the company that represents a proprietary unit. Please note that is either going to be capital growth, okay, um, liquidation dividend, or control vote. Okay. Um, you with an ordinary share as we know them in the past, you get what's left over. So once you've settled, you've sold your assets and settled your liabilities, um, you get what's left of this company, table 13 at the wedding. Or part of ownership is being able to direct how this company operates. That's your control and vote. And it often is a, a, a talking point across the table when you're negotiating and discussing these type of issues with clients is which is more important to them, control or cash? Because the way that they structure their share structures and the way they design the instruments, a control or cash are usually the two opposing forces. Um, for example, I've got one client. He is a multi, multi, multi millionaire, billionaire in his own right. Um, he's got these awesome patents that he's created and um, he is in the beauty industry and he set all the patents up in a trust, which obviously then gives the right to the company to use the patents and he gets royalties up to the trust. So his personal wealth is, is rather established, um, but he wants to look after the company that manufactures all these products. Uh, and he 
I hope that you enjoyed that video. For more of our webinar videos, go to www.accountingacademy.co.za. Thank you and have a lovely day.